Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to open this first plenary session of the 8th World Congress Against Death Penalty, which will uh, focus on the instrumentalization of the death penalty for political purposes. Let me start by thanking the Ensemble contre la Peine de Mort, my colleague Annalena Baerbock and the German Federal Foreign Office for the invitation and their excellent work in organizing and hosting this Congress. The Eighth World uh, Congress Against Death Penalty marks an additional step in our common effort to convince humanity that death penalty no longer belongs in our time. I say additional step because this effort, uh, which started a few years ago, is bearing fruit. Since the last World Congress against the death penalty, which took place, as we know, in 2019, multiple new countries have abolished the death penalty, such as Burkina Faso, Chad, Kazakhstan, Sierra Leone, Papua New Guinea, and in September this year, Equatorial Guinea was the last country to have joined the list. The warmly commend these uh, countries for their efforts towards our common cause and hope to see this trend gain momentum. I say, I say convincing humanity, because that is what we must do in our bilateral contacts at the UN, in regional and international forums, in the media, in schools, we have the responsibility to plead the cause of the abolition of death penalty, which respects dignity, but also with uh, conviction. To do this, we must develop a common strategy to raise awareness among international public opinion, parliamentarians, officials, and the uh, judiciary in uh, ret retentionist countries no change their approach, approach. I can only stress the importance of NGOs and members of, society, of civil society, as well as the media, in their role of fostering debate and also dialogue. Luxembourg is a strong proponent for the abolition of death penalty in all of today's society. In Luxembourg, death penalty was outlawed in uh, 1979. The abolition of the death penalty has since been written in our constitution, further cementing it into our national legal framework. It is important to stress that the death penalty does not deter crime any more than other punishments. It uh, disproportionately affects the poor, the minorities, and political opponents, and is politically instrumentalized in some countries. We know it. The instrumentalization of the death penalty for political purposes, which is also the topic of discussion of the present gathering, is particularly concerning. According to Ensemble contre la peine de mort annual report on Iran, one of the countries in the world with the highest number of executions in terms of its overall population, 120 people were executed between 2010 and 2019 for belonging to banned political groups. This is unacceptable, practice contrary to the rule of law. In overall numbers, Amnesty has reported that Iran has executed 314 people in 2021 and 251 people in the first half of this year. And real figures, we know it, are certainly even higher. In Iran, brave young women and men are risking their lives to demonstrate for their rights of, uh, and freedoms, and the brutal repression has killed already hundreds, while more than 14,000 14, have been arrested. 
Two days ago, Iran's revolutionary court has issued the first death sentence uh, linked to the recent protests. The unnamed protester has been convinced of a long list of alleged crimes, and in particular, I quote, spreading corruption on earth. This again illustrates how inhuman, brutal, and completely absurd the Iranian crackdown against their own people is. Iran is the sad leader in the number of executions, followed by Egypt with 83 reported executions and Saudi Arabia with 65. I would also like to stress that we condemn in the strongest terms the recent use of death penalty against political prisoners in Myanmar, ending a 30 years moratorium on the death penalty. Respect for the right to life takes precedent over the punitive power of the state. It is a question of a certain conception of humankind and of justice, of faith in the inherent dignity of each human being. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, allow me to commend the organizers of this Congress, the members of organizations who are working tireless for our common cause, not to mention the human rights defenders who, under sometimes extremely, extremely difficult conditions, are campaigning on the ground with uh, the aim of creating a widespread movement of awareness. May they count on us and on our support, on our commitment to move forward with them. Universal abolition remains our ultimate goal. Let us do everything possible so that one day we can be proud of the progress for humanity. Thank you very much, but before I conclude, laissez-moi dire quelques mots uh, en français, si vous permettez. If you allow me, I would like to say some words in French concerning current events. I've just come back from Brussels. There was a meeting of the foreign ministers from the European Union. We have made a first step ahead in order to show to the Iranians but also in order to show to the Iranian authorities and to show to the world that we do not accept this brutality. We do not accept this brutality under which the Iranians are suffering and that the Iranian government is, um, is, uh, is strengthening its oppression even further. So we, this was the first step. We have. Uh, written 31 people on a list who are uh, outlawed from traveling in Europe. I know very well, like you, that this is only the first step. With this measure, we won't change Iran. We know what we can do at this moment, and we do it. We're doing it, and as I said, once again, this is only a first step. I think that the judges who condemn, who sentence young people and take away their life because they have listened to music, because uh, maybe their hair is sticking out of their veil and uh, or the heat drop, because they want to live their life that they want to live. Those judges, but also those parliamentarians, those parliamentarians who demand, demand from the Iranian authorities to use this horrible death penalty, I think this list must become even longer in the future, this list of names. If you like, I can also say some words in German. We have often said that in Europe, and also in Germany, that you, we shouldn't do business, we do, shouldn't do any business with a regime such as uh, the one of uh, Putin. I'm, I agree. If you, we don't do any business anymore with, with the current uh, Russian regime, if we stop doing business with those regimes like the Putin regime, and then there's 
we should think about it. Maybe we should stop uh, doing business as well with the regime of the Raisi, shouldn't we? Human rights are violated there. The values as such are violated in Russia, but also in Iran. I'm deeply convinced that, and you know it, that many things can be bought in this world, probably too much. It is possible to buy too many things in this world, but, but human rights are not negotiable. And this is about the dignity, about human dignity. This is about elementary human dignity. There are so many young people here in this hall, even if I can't see you. But I have one message. To you. Defend democracy. Without democracy, we won't have the possibility to defend our values, to defend the dignity of the human being. Bonjour à tous. J'espère que tout le monde m'entend. Good afternoon. I, Merci I hope that you can hear me. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Perron. Je suis le directeur des programmes I'm Nicolas de Perron. I'm the director of the, of the program of ECPM. Je suis très honoré. It is a great honor for me to moderate this plenary session, this plenary session of the 8th World Congress against the death penalty. I'm very glad to see you here. We are very numerous today here in Rodel System. Three years after our separation due to the pandemic, I think we all need this kind of event in order to come together again and to in order to elaborate new strategies of action um, with the aim of the abolition of the death penalty. The Academic and Scientific Committee of the World Congress has asked us to think about a big problem with respect to the abolition. It is about the instrumentalization of the death penalty for political purposes. So our big task is to analyze the different images of um, uh, politics because uh, there are too many political justifications in place for the death penalty in 2022. I would like to remind you that among the three the countries who execute most, most of them do it for political reasons. I think about Iran, I think about China, I'm thinking about Saudi Arabia, I'm thinking about Iraq, the United States of America. Um, after those uh, uh, execution, federal executions that took place on the initiative of the, uh, Donald Trump um, at the end of his uh, presidential mandate. So it is my privilege to have this discussion with so eminent personalities from all over the world. It will be a conversation with any, every one of them. It is really a privilege for me and an honor. And I would like to thank you, first of all, to be here today and to come this long way to Berlin. It is my honor to talk to Christelle Wanga from the Democratic Republic of Congo, to many more from Myanmar, with Chef Razar from Egypt, with Ali Adoubisi from Saudi Arabia, with Mahmoud Amiri Mogadam from Iran, and with uh, Mr. Dog from Mongolia. I will present you in more detail, of course, when we're starting a conversation. This session is, uh, will take uh, two hours. You can use the simultaneous interpretation. There are still headsets available at the reception. And this plenary session will, for the first time, be 
on live streaming Sans in the social tarder. media. So avant de la let's start immediately. And before I give the floor to our panelists, I would like to suggest to you to look at a video. It's about a, a person who is very loyal to our World Congress, who has participated here. And she, it is a, it's the, uh, the former Special Rapporteur of the United States of the United Nations. Mrs. Agnès Calamar, the video is seven minutes. She will speak in English. There will be French subtitles in the video. Just after the video, we will start our conversation. Good afternoon, abolitionist friends and colleagues. I am very sad not to be able to join you in person at this World Congress Against the Death Penalty. But I'm very glad that you are all taking this time to meet as a movement, recharge, strategize. This is particularly important after the separation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And at a time when we have seen unprecedented attacks on human rights in a changing global landscape. The session put the spotlight on how the use of the death penalty is frequently politicized, and that manifests in different ways. For instance, we regularly see how the death penalty is used as a tool of state repression. And we will hear examples of this from the panelists, including on the recent unlawful executions in Myanmar, political executions. The death penalty has long been used as ammunition to ramp up populist rhetoric, including in the lead up to elections, with ill-founded promises to deliver justice, make society safer, in my recent missions to West Africa last week, I heard too many would-be political candidates making use of this rhetoric for cheap political gains, cheap and dangerous. In other countries, politicians and government officials refer to the death penalty as a way of showing the strong hand of the state to score points, including towards building trust in state institution in the aftermath of heinous crimes. This happened, for instance, in South Asia, where officials and others wrongly suggest that death penalty can contribute to end, ending gender-based violence and murders. This happening too in China, where the death penalty is imposed and used to punish corruption by the highest and other state officials. In Iran, the authorities use the death penalty disproportionately against members of ethnic minorities as a tool of political repression. In Saudi Arabia, the death penalty is used by the state to counter anti-government protest, to counter dissent, and targeting as well minorities. In many retentionist countries, including the USA, Japan, Vietnam, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and others, this inhuman punishment reflect political choices and a political agenda at all stages. It is evident in how the police investigation is conducted, evident Again, how a case is charged and prosecuted. Evident again in how a case charges specific individuals for death penalty and not others. It's evident in how a jury is selected. It's evident in the resources made available for the defense. It's evident in which experts get to testify when, where, how a case is heard, when, where, how this penalty is imposed and kills. Many of you will remember the film 
the penalty, which was shown at the Sixth World Congress. In that movie, we followed the story of a mother seeking justice for the murder of her daughter. She went from asking for the death penalty to opposing it after realizing that her pain and her daughter's case had become a pound in local politics and elections. That is just one among many, many examples around the world where even in abolitionist country, the possibility of death penalty comes back, comes back when the society is confronting heinous crimes, comes back when politicians are trying to use the pain, the suffering, the fear to get elected. Exposing those elements help us all understand that the, the death penalty is politicized, is political. It is a political tool in the hands of people who will stop at nothing to get their political agenda realized. It is a political tool and therefore it is inherently arbitrary. It must be combated. It must be defeated. And dear friends, this is a fight we can win, we must win, and we will win. Thank you very much. And I'm a wonderful session in solidarity. Merci beaucoup de votre attention et Thanks nous sommes très heureux d'avoir pu diffuser ce message Very très militant d'Agnès Calamar qui, qui est à ton pour, pour galvaniser les, les énergies en faveur de la position message. de la peine de mort. Il est temps maintenant de, de démarrer la première partie de notre first part. Nous souhaitons nous attarder sur un aspect qui est encore malheureusement d'actualité dans de like nombreux pays du C'est l'utilisation de la peine de mort comme arme pour résoudre les Um, the instrumentalization of the death penalty um, for political purposes. So we are very happy here to um, say hello to Christelle Vuanga, who is a member of parliament in the National Assembly and the president of the Gender, Child and Family Committee. She is also the president of the Network of Parliamentarians Against the Death Penalty. So the RDC is among the countries who applied the death penalty Vionga, in the past a lot, unfortunately. My question is very easy. Um, 19 years after the last execution, there are still politics who want to remain with the death penalty until today. And this morning, we heard about uh, the, the, dis, uh, the talk of your Minister of Justice, which was ambivalent. And so how do you explain uh, that the uh, death penalty is still um, in use in Congo. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here and uh, I'd like to express my support to the Iranian women who are so brave and courageous. And, uh, how it's so shocking um, that people can be killed because uh, their veil is not uh, uh, appropriately knotted on the head of a woman. So when it comes to the um, justification of death penalty, um, well, that uh, for security issues in the east of our country, for many years now we are facing 
in conflicts and aggressions by some neighboring countries and also identitary uh, conflicts. And um, there are many rapes and uh, people buried alive and other atrocities. And uh, our people seems to be listening to all kinds of vengeance uh, discourses. And often politicians are afraid um, to uh, be against the death penalty publicly. And that's why uh, parliamentarians, politicians, um, De dire qu'on va tuer tous ceux go qui tuent. with Même uh, si the majority and um, that's uh, very very difficult and also there's a little bit uh, like drinking alcohol we know it's not good but it's a short term solution so we are afraid uh, to stand up for our own opinion when it comes to death penalty and uh, parliamentarians with 100 million people of uh, there are always many of them who uh, just uh, say what they expected to say and they do not dare to stand up for their own opinions and it's so difficult to do so, and parliamentarians are uh, members of parliament and the president of the Republic. Um, they do not dare to be abolitionists, and everybody thinks that the president is responsible. Thank you for this very clear answer. You are talking about the conflict in the East. Uh, the minister talked about this this morning. So how to talk to people who think that um, apology Abolition is in favor of impunity. Well, we adopted three things. We tried to approach, to discuss, and to convince. We invite retentionist colleagues to our reunion, and afterwards they change their opinion. But that's not easy. We can't um, overcome this kind of received ideas by magical tricks. But we try to explain that um, the death penalty is not useful. It has nothing to do with impunity. There's no correlation. And very often, those who talk the most about retention of uh, this uh, punishment are not well informed at all. We try to convince parliamentarians. Convincing is not easy. You need time, you need energy and we are convinced that this fight is to go towards them and to convince them. And in RDC, there are many abolitionists, young abolitionists uh, who form groups and who couldn't obtain a visa to be here with us today, but they are still uh, communicating with us. There are also a lawyer networks and journalists Journalist networks and also a parliamentarian network, the biggest network in our parliament, and they try their best to give um, some of this new energy to uh, the uh, remaining retentionists. So deterrent effects of uh, death penalty, is that uh, um, something uh, 
you could uh, you could explain unfortunately this is anchored in the population for the simple reason that they are not well informed and if you take a mic uh, and if you listen in the streets of Kinshasa uh, when it comes to um, these youngsters who um, operate with the machines precisely in large cities um, and if you ask uh, what we have to do with these youngsters um, uh, these young criminals many people think we have to kill them but that's not true it's uh, linked to um, the fact that uh, uh, they are unemployed and we have now a grand coalition of um, different uh, sectors and fields and we work a lot with the, in, in workshops through workshops and reunions and others in order to answer this question and uh, also there's a, another leverage the strength of our churches many religious personalities are very active in our networks and we have to convince them to join our, our networks to work against the death penalty thank you very much uh, a personal question when it comes to uh, political courage of parliaments parliamentarians so you are the um, president of parliamentarians against death penalty um, do you have any kinds of problems and how do you envisage your political future? Personally, I do, I'm not facing uh, uh, problems. I'm abolitionist, uh, and I've been abolitionist for many years before I became a parliamentarian. And I'm not ashamed to say it loud and proud, and everybody knows what my attitude is when it comes to death penalty. So no personal problems so far. Thank you. In order to continue our exchange, so there was a vote on a uh, moratorium uh, just uh, on last Friday, a moratorium of 19 years, but unfortunately, um, in this vote of the United Nations, the RDC was not present, and we had been hoping that you would be in favor of this moratorium. But still, as we heard this morning, is not really very promising. So there's going to be a new vote at the um, plenary assembly of the United Nations. Is there a message for your parliament? Uh, when it comes to the next vote in December? Yes, of course. I'm burning to talk with our minister in order to ask them why we didn't vote. But uh, I think for our network, that's just a transition and only a... Um, a sign of the difficult context in which we work. So it's just a sign to put more energy in our fight against death penalty. And together with our network, I'm very optimistic. We were talking to ministers, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs said, well, he was promising 
some change, but you know, uh, a, such a fight needs patience. And when it comes to the message of the Minister for Human Rights in the context of the present conflict, I would like to um, quote our colleagues from Angola, they have just the same conflicts, or uh, Central Africa. So there are so many conflicts, but still they could abolish the death penalty. So it's not convincing to say that we can't abolish the death penalty because of our conflicts in the east of the country. That's not true. And it's our fight to counter these arguments. And um, the fact that uh, last Friday RDC didn't vote is only encouraging for us, because we know we have to fight harder and make more efforts. Even slavery was in some constitutions, enshrined in some constitutions in the United States, for example. So, but slavery was abolished. And uh, those days are over now. And one day we will abolish the death penalty in our country. And our life will continue especially, but much better, especially for the um, prisoners of death row. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci à tous. Merci beaucoup, Madame Vuanga, pour votre engagement sans faille sur cette question Merci de l'abolition. Merci, pour votre commitment. Et vous avez dit que vous vous appelez à l'abolition de cette abolition dans la Centrale-Afrique. Donc, Central Africa. So, there are members of the CATIASA qui sont présents. Et congratulations pour ce milestone. Désormais, je, je souhaiterais maintenant euh, like m'intéresser au cas d'un pays qu'on a finalement, je l'ai constaté en, en préparant euh, cette session plénière, finalement peu abordé euh, dans l'histoire des congrès mondiaux contre la peine de mort, c'est le cas du, du Myanmar. Nous ne parlons pas beaucoup dans le contexte de la mort de la peine de mort, donc c'est un honneur que beaucoup de Mongols puissent attendre cette conférence. Vous êtes un researcher spécialisé en Myanmar at Human Rights Watch. You are very much uh, committed and very active when it comes to the social media. And Myanmar is a retentionist uh, country, which after 40 years of moratorium decided to execute uh, four people uh, pos uh, in, uh, in 2021. Sorry. So what is the correlation between the death penalty and uh, the coup militaire of February? Thank you so much for having me. Um, Merci I beaucoup de m'avoir. Sorry. Um, so just as you said, Dekla, um, you know, we probably haven't spoken about Myanmar much in this particular Congress, so I just want to give a little bit of background. We had decades of military regime in Myanmar, five decades. And um, in 2012, we started the democratic uh, process, the path towards democracy. And this was a really exciting um, and revolutionary time. You know, no one had expected the military regime to allow democracy to unfold. Um, so for about 10 years, we had relative progress with uh, an elected government in 2015 with um, the National League for Democracy Party that was led by Aung San Suu Kyi, who was a human rights icon, um, but unfortunately failed to speak up in regards to the ethnic Muslim minority group called the Rohingya. And um, I think from here, we can really see the unraveling of uh, a you know, democracy that's a fledgling democracy 
um, but also how much of a grip the military had on, on our country. Um, so the executions in July follow the military coup in February 2021. Uh, the military contested the elections of November 2020 where the NLD, the National League for Democracy, won an overwhelming majority. Uh, they said that it was, um, you know, rigged, that it was unfair. And if you look at the language, it very much closely followed what was happening um, with Trump in the US, so possibly they got their ideas from another country. Um, and uh, they claimed a coup in uh, February 2021. So surprisingly for the military, the, the resistance was really widespread and um, again led by youth, a generation who had enjoyed relative freedom for the past 10 years and um, who'd grown up in relative freedom. So this group of people, the Gen Z, were really reluctant to give up, you know, the enjoyment of having a bit of freedom, the internet, um, having education abroad. And so unfortunately, this group of youth who should have been students, who should have been, you know, partying and having fun, they're the ones who are wearing the brunt of this right now because of the failures of our past. Um, they're the ones who are being held in prisons, they're being tortured, um, the crackdowns on the protests very early on were violent and aggressive and you know we very very quickly established that crimes against humanity were occurring um, and you know we've we've heard a few words here about the death penalty which is things like irreversibility reprehensible but i want to introduce one new word which is impunity what we see now going on in myanmar is what happens after years of impunity the military has been allowed by the international community to retain its grip. Um, there have been some pressure from the international community over the years on, on Myanmar, but um, the atrocities that they've committed, particularly since 2017, were not punished enough. Um, they were allowed to continue to act without pressure. And this is what we're seeing now from the fallout. So the political environment goes from a very, very long way. But um, as Agnes said earlier, you know, it's, it's a political tool that the military are using simply to instill fear. And it's because they were so surprised by the resistance and by the way that the resistance has continued to keep motivating each other. Um, it's a little bit of a move in desperation and a little bit to test the waters of how the EU how the US, how the UK will react. Um, and regionally, unfortunately, we didn't see much pressure from our, our Asian counterparts. Merci beaucoup pour, pour votre réponse extrêmement précise. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, that's la, that's very precise en, en and very enlightening. Selon vous, quel est what would you say, what is the impact of these executions on the population? How is it seen? How is it perceived? Uh, is there a lot of fear that there will be more um, executions? What's the precise impact of these executions? Um, so when, when the military grabbed power, they went about very quickly dismantling the progress that we'd made over the, the past, you know, 10 years of democracy. Um, they used the law, they amended laws to make them more uh, draconian. Um, they criminalized protests, they criminalized uh, certain expressions of speech. They limited the internet and shut down the internet across the country. So even though in the very early days, and similar with cases with Iran as well, you see protests and protesters, but they shut down the internet knowing that they don't want other people to get, um, uh, you know, supported by this act. So in terms of what happened, I think it's very, very clear that the military were trying to instill fear among the, the resistance movement. 
The four people that they killed were all political activists, two of whom were very well known. One was the long-term political activist and democracy fighter. Um, another one was actually an opposition government lawmaker. He was a, he was a minister of parliament and they killed him. And, um, you know, on a personal note, the, the shock and the, the way in which it happened, um, I, have a, I have a story I can tell. I was myself in uh, Mesot on the border of Thailand doing some research um, in July and meeting with the wives of these women. And uh, I met with them on a Saturday morning, had coffee with them, and then uh, heard that their families had been invited in Myanmar to, to meet with the prisoners. And they felt a little bit strange about it because after months of not having any contact, um, yeah, they, they were invited to see or at least speak to them via Zoom. Uh, on Sunday, I prepared to go back home. And um, on Monday, we heard from state media that the men were already executed on Saturday morning at dawn. Now, the family found out the same way, or the families found out the same way that we did after the fact and through the state media. So you can just imagine um, the pain and the horror that friends and family have had to endure, but also what that meant for the resistance movement, what that meant for the opposition, you know, to say that um, we can do whatever we want to you at any time because we have been immune and impune all this time and that we're defiant because international pressure isn't working. Um, but if anything, that means more than ever we need to apply more pressure. And I urge the states that do still have this law in effect, um, it's very dangerous because it can turn on you at any time. We, we had a moratorium where we didn't even think that this was going to be an issue at any point in time. But um, obviously when you have uh, an unscrupulous power in place, uh, they will use that to their benefit. And this is what we've seen, is, is an unscrupulous power come into play and use a, a, a law that really should have been abolished and removed um, within the last 10 years. So it's a really hard lesson learned. Merci beaucoup. Alors, Thank you very much. We, our objective here at the World Congress is, of course, to elaborate, to draw up strategies to advance concretely towards of the death penalty. You know this uh, situation perfectly. What can we do? What should we do in a country like Myanmar? What are the needs for social, civil society in Myanmar in order to abolish uh, the death penalty in Myanmar step by step? <laughs> this is a really hard question when we're working with a closed country um, where, you know, civil society actually are not allowed to operate freely. And um, I myself am working in exile. We have one more Myanmar person here who's a journalist. She's working in exile. Um, it's hard for us to get information in and out of the country, particularly when the internet is shut down and they um, have imposed live surveillance on phone calls. So even if we call someone on their cell phone, we have to be so careful because we don't know where they are, their conversations may be listened to. Um, it's very sophisticated, the technologies that are being used. However, there, um, there are some positives, and uh, one of them is that at the International Court of Justice, um, a little tiny country called Gambia has decided to present a case of genocide against Myanmar at the, at the ICJ. And it's such a brave and important move because now other countries such as Germany and uh, Canada and the UK have said that they will also join the intervention to say what happened in 2017 against the Rohingya people was genocide. Um, so they will test that. But that's one way in a mechanism that we can use you know, internationally to hold accountable um, countries or states that are violating people's rights. 
There's also the International Criminal Court. And one thing that I'm trying to advocate for is that um, you know, European countries, other democratic states really support the UN Security Council resolution to pass um, an arms embargo on Myanmar and to stop allowing other states to sell military weapons to a military that is basically attacking their own population. It makes sense. Uh, but actually, we also need a UN security referral to the International Criminal Court for the country situation. And this means that countries are then obligated to put in funds to start investigating these crimes and, and not be investigating them 10 years later when we've lost most of the information or even maybe possibly people because either they've been killed or they've been removed from the situation. Um, but there's a lot we can do. And I think that democratic states have a very important role to play. So while um, the European Union and you know Germany, et cetera, have put into place targeted sanctions on some of these leaders in Myanmar, the, the senior officials of the military, um, we need to see more action. And that means things like the resolutions being passed, but also support at the regional level, because at this moment, ASEAN and Asia is um, very volatile. Um, we have a lot of countries that have dictatorships in this region at the moment, and they're hesitant to speak out against Myanmar because that means then that there might be scrutiny on themselves. But that's why I go back to this word of impunity. Um, we shouldn't allow violations and these atrocity crimes to continue wherever without making sure that the perpetrators are held responsible. And in this, in this case, it's always the military. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. A last short question in order to close this, this session. I already alluded to it. Um, that's the vote of the United Nations on a moratorium on executions. Um, that was um, one week ago at the th third committee. Myanmar has decided to relaunch executions. However, Myanmar um, now has a favorable vote. There's no abstention anymore at the United Nations. How can we explain the situation passing now to um, abstention? Again, to the political situation where prior to February 2021, we have the National League for Democracy Party in place, which is pro-democracy. And our UN ambassador is actually um, the appointee from that government. He's still in place. And we have a very complicated situation right now where we actually have um, an exile or civilian government that is in exile. Uh, and they are challenging the junta at this point in time about their leadership and the power that they play. So what we're seeing here is actually what we could have in Myanmar if we have a full democracy. So we must dismantle the military. Merci beaucoup, Manny Mong, pour, pour Thank you very much, Manny Mong, for this very instructive, informative uh, conversation on Myanmar. In order to, to wrap up this session, using the death penalty as an arm for uh, solving political, political conflicts, we, of course, we have to think about con the conflict in, the, in Eastern Europe. And it's a great honor for me to show you a video. It was prepared for this World Congress. The person cannot be here in person, but uh, the person, Madame Tikhonouskaya, has sent us this uh, video message. Uh, for, um, it's a symbol for democracy and freedom. Uh, she got the Sakharov Prize Award, and you will find a, a French translation in the video. Dear friends, today I speak on behalf of millions of Belarusians who in 2020 chose freedom, democracy, and human rights over oppression and tyranny. The dictator Lukashenko lost the election and waged a war against his own people. Hundreds of thousands were forced into exile, jailed, tortured. Many got charged with terrorism and may even face the death penalty. 
The regime in Belarus is using the death penalty as a tool of repression and a tool of intimidation against the people. If earlier the fear of the death penalty was abstract and distant, now many political activists live in fear of being shot dead. Today, Belarus is the only state in Europe that still executes people. Human Rights Defenders report that since Belarus gained its independence in 1991, over 300 people have been sentenced to death. Until this year, the death penalty was prescribed for over 13 crimes. This year, the regime has put three more articles in the list of mortal crimes. Now a person can be sentenced to death for attempts to carry out acts of terrorism. It is basically a thought crime punishment. Executioners in Belarus do not look into the victim's eyes. The person sentenced to death is blindfolded, led to a special room, shot in the back of the head. Before that very minute, no appeals would be considered. No reports of torture would reach the court. Days or years before the shot, a condemned person is held in total isolation, treated by prison guards like already dead. No works or letters are allowed. No visits from relatives. Conditions of detention on death row have repeatedly led to suicide attempts. Such attempts are halted, as the state reserves the right to kill. The bodies of those executed are not released to their families. The time and place of execution or even the place of burial are kept secret. Relatives cannot say goodbye to their loved one, cannot bury him in accordance with the family traditions, cannot visit his tomb. According to the United Nations Human Rights Committee, the whole process is designed to intentionally leave families in a state of uncertainty and mental distress. This is torture for the innocent. To understand the use of the death penalty in my country, you have to understand the climate of repression that Belarusians are living in. Today, more than 1,350 political prisoners are suffering in human conditions, and the number keeps rising. Just recently, civic activist Mikolai Avtuhovich was sentenced to 25 years in prison. The regime accused Mikolai in terrorism alongside other defendants, a pensioner, a priest, a disabled man with one leg and civic activist. Together, they share a sentence over 200 years. It was regime's revenge for their political stance. Death penalty in Belarus is a part of the intimidation policy. The purpose of each sentence is to spread fear. The regime believes it can only survive if Belarusians are too scared to resist. Legalized killing to suppress political dissent is one of many repressive traditions that remained since Soviet time. Over the 28 years of Lukashenko's dictatorship, many who dared to speak out against him simply disappeared. Now he tries to build a legal base for his crimes. Death penalty in Belarus is a real threat for those who resist Russian occupation and show solidarity with Ukraine. For our brave partisans who sabotage railways to stop Russian troops. For those who join resistance or even donate to the Ukrainian army. We cannot discuss the death penalty as part of the legal system, because the law in Belarus simply doesn't work. We have a repression machine built to keep the dictator in power. The machine that would kill anyone in the way. The death penalty is not the only problem in Belarus, but it is a symptom of an inhuman regime that is ready to kill for its own interests. And the problem should be treated comprehensively. Only the dismantling of the regime and democratic transition in Belarus will ensure the end of killings and repressions. 
So I call on you to speak out loudly about every case of repression in my country. Strong pressure through sanctions can put an end to torture and crimes against humanity. We must collect evidences of human rights crimes in order to bring perpetrators to justice using international courts and universal jurisdiction. We must stop the use of the death penalty as a disguise for political killings, not only in Belarus, but worldwide. Dictators without any legitimacy like to pretend that they are acting in a legal way, that they are fighting terrorism, you name it. But we need to call it what it is, murder. And if you want to live in a world where human rights mean something, where human life means something, criminals like Lukashenko should take a seat before the tribunal. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. This was a very moving video message, very strong message from this uh, leader from Belarus. I would like to um, welcome uh, the leader of uh, NGOs as well uh, in uh, Belarus, the leader of, of the abolitionist cause in Belarus. Mr. Paluna has been nominated in the category for the great uh, Robert Badinter Prize Award. It will be awarded for this time on Friday, together with uh, Madame Yogela, Mr. Agul Kamila, and Madame Saskutge. Uh, you may vote. Um, for these prize awards at the 8th World Congress, I would like to invite you to, to choose the one who will receive the prize at the closing session. Now we're going to start the second part of our plenary session. There is a, a very, this is a very important topic in an argumentation for abolition. The use of a death penalty as a political means in order to, to silence dissidents and, uh, in order to control the population. So and there are three representatives here from three countries who are among the five countries who execute most in the world, and this for decades. Iran, that's the country which executes most with respect to the population, Saudi Arabia and Egypt. So now we're going to start a conversation about this topic. We are going to try to understand how the death penalty is used by regimes against political opponents and dissidents. Mahmoud Amri Mugadan, you are a human rights activist and the director of the Hu Iran Human Rights, you, you publish an annual report together with our uh, organization for many years. Mr. Sherif Azir, you are the program director at the Egyptian Commission for Rights and Freedoms, ECRF, and Mr. Ali Adoubisi, you are the co-founder co of the European Saudi Organization for Human Rights, ISOR, which is based here in Berlin, in Germany. My first collegial question is very simple. Could you explain us very briefly how the death penalty is used in your respective countries against op 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 opponents, dissidents, and against human rights defenders? How is it used? Who would like to take the floor firstly? Mahmoud? I can start. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here among so many um, human rights defenders. Um, you probably, uh, everybody knows that there is uh, a protest going on in Iran, uh, which is in its uh, eighth or ninth week, actually. So the protest that started, or the, they were triggered after the brutal murder of uh, Mahsa Amini, which uh, you mentioned, they have turned into nationwide protests where Iranian people have come on the streets and they say that we have had enough of an oppressive, incompetent, and corrupt regime. According to Iran Human Rights, uh, uh, at least 326 people have been killed on the streets, and uh, exactly as it happened in Myanmar, they shut down the internet, put restrictions, and uh, 
started shooting, but they haven't managed to control. Thousands have been arrested, and many of them are in danger of being sentenced to death. We know of at least 20 who are facing charges that are punishable by death, and one death sentence has been issued. We are very uh, concerned that um, unless there is a very strong international reaction, um, or unless the political cost of this is increased dramatically, we might be facing a mass execution. And that's why we have called on the international community to send a strong warning to Iranian authorities that execution of protesters will have severe consequences. So uh, back to your questions. Yes, that penalty has always been used by Iranian authorities as a tool to spread fear. In the 80s, uh, people who were um, having, keeping a leaflet or selling a newspaper belonging to um, uh, opposition group could be executed. Uh, a cousin of mine was executed, 19 year old, in 1980. The reason why the Iranian authorities can't do it now is not because they have changed their opinion, because the exact same people are there. Iran's president today, he was member of a death commission in 1988, uh, executing several thousand people. So the reason why they can't do it is because it has a very high political cost. So even Iranian authorities, they care about political cost. If the cost is too high, they will not do it, and that's why we are asking international community to react. But um, so how do they use the death penalty now uh, against uh, opponents? Since we don't have uh, an independent judiciary, basically judiciary is part of the, uh, the oppressive system, they can arrest anyone, charge him or her to any charges and sentence to death. So you will probably hear that protesters who are going to be sentenced to death, they have been committing crimes like uh, killing someone or putting on fire, and there is no due process, there are no fa fair trials, access to lawyer. And, uh, uh, and this is, uh, uh, I would say, Iranian authorities can't put someone on trial and execute him because he's an activist, but they will force confessions, they will use the judicial system to, um, uh, to, to justify the execution. Um, I think that, uh, uh, I, I will just add one more thing. The reason why we have this protest is that the barrier of fear that Iranian authorities have been building for so many years is falling apart. Uh, this barrier of fear is built partly by death penalty. So death penalty is the, uh, the most important instrument I think for many dictators, because uh, dictators that, uh, who do not have popular support, they need to use fear in order to appear more powerful and make people feel more powerless. So when you have a government that is able to take life, then it, they appear very powerful. So uh, uh, before the protests, uh, we have seen that, as you said, in many years, Iran has had highest number of executions after China. Most people who are executed, they are not executed for political charges. They are executed for drug-related charges or homicide, but the aim is still political repression. So uh, we have done a research showing that Timing of the executions are closely related with political events. When authorities fear protests or expect protests, the number of executions increase. And this is what we have seen since May, because the protests we see now, they started gradually in May. And since then, we have had 
more than two to three executions every day until this protest started. So even if the execution is for a charge like drug trafficking or any other criminal act, but it has a political purpose. So that's why we say every execution is a political execution. Merci beaucoup, c'est extrêmement intéressant. Effectivement, donc il y a un lien direct selon vous. Thank you so much. That's very interesting. And uh, this direct link between our people taking to the streets and executions and fear. Ali, what would you say? Is that the same phenomenon, uh, Sherif? Uh, thank you very much for this chance. To, and uh, actually for opening the talk about Egypt, which is, uh, you get the impression that it got forgotten. And um, the regime's whitewashing for the image of Egypt is, um, is actually working. That as we, we sit here, uh, leaders of the world are uh, meeting in Sharm el-Sheikh at the COP27, greeted by the Egyptian regime and um, and showing off the, that they, uh, they actually have human rights uh, in Egypt, which is not true. Uh, Egypt is the third world um, executioner uh, country after China and uh, Iran. Uh, the most recent uh, documentation of, uh, of executions that we have between 2020 and 2021 is actually 160 executions of men and 16 cases of executions of women. Uh, most of those cases are political, which also takes the form of um, a mass trial, which is actually a whole combination of violations leading to the, a death penalty that starts through um, ex um, mass arrest and then a, a period of um, uh, ten, um, um, enforced disappearance and uh, torture and uh, confession under torture and actually ended up to a referral to a court of a mass trial that um, sometimes reach uh, hundreds, sometimes like five, over 500 of um, defendants at the same time. Uh, which also um, renders a lot of the rights of the defendants, including the proper uh, uh, defense and uh, all the due process that uh, comes with it. Um, the thing makes you f think at the end that the, the whole judicial system is actually not functioning. Um, seeing this way of how the, um, the trials are going, and uh, even even though the, um, the political, like, even when you think that there are non-political cases, where like normal criminal cases that um, that not politically uh, motivated it's still there is always um, a line of political um, purpose behind this uh, the most recent is the, um, there was um, public anger uh, after a few of the murders in, in public murders in uh, against uh, women and um, the murderers have been tried and sentenced to death within three weeks, uh, which actually like some of those cases uh, received like four sessions at the court and they ended up in, in, um, in a death penalty, in a death sentence at the end. Uh, those three weeks, it doesn't even give you the time to review the, like, the, the forensic report or anything. Um, so in, in, in general, like the, the most of these cases that uh, like the, the, the regime is using the death penalty in these cases, just as a political tool to control, uh, to for suppression, uh, to show the strong hands of the regime, which I find a lot of similarities with Iran. Also, as my colleague here mentioned, uh, also most of these um, most of these cases, the the regime is trying to show sometimes uh, what we can say as revenge. So, uh, in 2019, there were a lot of uh, situations where the um, the regime applied the, the used the execution mass executions actually around the time uh, after uh, terrorist attacks uh, and it happened very frequent at the time around three three mass executions that happened within the, the course of two months in 2019 uh, also the the regime re uses um, deception actually and lies about the use of death penalty in egypt whenever they are being faced about like like when we asked them of, about abolition, 
the reply that we always get is that uh, death penalty in Egypt is applying the, the Islamic Sharia law, which actually is not is not true. This is a lie. Uh, the death penalty in Egypt is purely a, a civil uh, secular law uh, being applied, and none of the Sharia law is applied in, in any of the criminal laws in Egypt. Um, also, in, in general, also a statement in general, the, the whole uh, situation of human rights in Egypt is is uh, very deteriorated, and um, uh, colleagues are uh, being arrested. Uh, and I have to mention close colleagues who are now in detention: Ala Abdel Fattah and Muhammad Al Baqir and others who are facing actually not death sentence but death as Zala has been on um, hunger strike for uh, three months now, and his, uh, his health is in a very deteriorated situation. And uh, yeah, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Sherif. And uh, as my friend Mahmoud just said, that uh, uh, when people take to the streets, uh, there will be more executions. Well, it's, uh, it's always been this um, um, expectations that the, that the government will um, will increase the, the suppression uh, whenever they feel that there is a threat uh, in, mass, in, in demonstrations. And this has actually happened uh, very dramatically in 2019, where like 4,000 people have been arrested within two days when there was calls of demonstrations. And uh, up until now, most of them are still, there is a big number of them are still in detention. Uh, and actually facing um, charges that are death eligible, that would be might be facing death sentence. Um, so, so yes, and it's always like it's always um, a card that the, the regime will bring up whenever they feel uh, threatened, whenever they feel um, uh, opposition. And um, the the most clear example is that the one of the big uh, mass trial cases is actually uh, against the. Um, the former members of the former regime, and they are, there's 12 of the of one of the main cases are now on death row for, and that, that imminent risk of execution. Ali, si vous souhaitez également répondre aux questions à la question précédente. Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, having me in this uh, conference. Would you like to answer uh, to you, Ali? Yeah. I would like to uh, express about my feeling about this conference. I think at least it will empower all those people. They are interesting and they are fighting against this penalty. I am one of them, and this chance will empower me, of course. Uh, this, the situation in Egypt, Iran, Myanmar, Belarus here, when the uh, speakers here, they are talking, I feel the same situation in my country. Uh, that's why I will not repeat some of the what said because those countries in general they are simil similar. Uh, I would like to highlight about at the beginning of uh, my intervention about uh, death penalty against human rights defenders, opponents, etc. The role for Western country in my in my country in general and how they are make encourage for our government to implement more death penalty. For example, in 2020, there is 27 execution in Saudi Arabia, and this first time happening in last years, a very low number comparing to a lot of years, 27. But after that, uh, MBS, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, a lot of you here knows he is responsible about murder uh, Jamal Khashoggi in Saudi Council in Turkey and this popular st story around the world. He is responsible, of course. He feeling there is a pressure and he need to like stop some violation among them, the death penalty. And it, he reduced the number. But what happened later on? And this, I think, one of the big problem for death penalty in general in Saudi Arabia. Uh, in December 2021, Macron, he visits Saudi Arabia. And this, of course, will send a negative message. 
that MBS, he can do the violation.